with every big shot historian I had their email address or could call and it, I had never seen it nobody had ever seen it and that was a picture obviously taken of Hood probably in the winter of 1863-64 he has recovered from his Chickamauga wound he's getting ready to go back into service as a corps commander uh, in Johnston's Army of Tennessee now some people that are experts, they know from that carpet whose studio in Richmond that is. You know, you get one of these Civil War photography experts. I don't know that. But that is the only photograph that we know of uh, that actually has him stand. As you all know, most you know photos were busts of him and everybody else. So that's quite <coughs> unique in, in its own right. Um, the owners allowed me to, well first of all they had it restored and then they allowed me to use it on the cover of my book and uh, there are no there are no other reproductions of that yet but there will be next year they're when they're going to go ahead and identify I think what they're doing now is they're working with like their insurance and and all kinds of stuff this kind of was you know fell on this kind of like a lottery winner you know you you um, you know, they knew it was important, but they, they thought that it was important only from a family standpoint, and they weren't, they weren't quite so, you know, sure of its importance scholastically. So anyway, but they're going to identify themselves whenever they feel like it, and, uh, and they, they allowed me to have that. Um, now, if I don't mess this up, my practice runs have been great. Okay. What was in the collection? Oops. What was in the collection? I'm going through there and I open up an envelope and I open it up and lo and behold, this is John Bell Hood's commission certificate. You know, we have our diplomas and our licenses and our whatever and we frame them and we put them on the wall. Your doctor, your accountant, if you're like me, your elementary school diploma. Uh, but anyway, I had never seen a general's certificate in the Civil War. So I open up this envelope, and here is his brigadier general certificate. I, I had also come across his first lieutenant's commission in the, in the U.S. Army from 1853. I saw this, and I thought, wow, that's cool. I open the next one, and there's his major general's commission. And I'm thinking, that's way cool. I open another one, there's a Lieutenant General's Commission. And I completed the straight royal flush. There is the man's general certificate. I'm sitting there, and here is Brigadier, Major, Lieutenant, and Full General, the general certificates. I mean, that is, some of these things are like the Dead Sea Scrolls to Civil War history. Um, and you'll notice on the general certificate, it says to the temporary rank. Now again, I, I, when I get in groups, you know, some, some people are more Civil War ex history experts than others, but as many of you all know, he was promoted to general, but because they had, you know, you had to go through Congress and you had to do all this, they kind of found a way to, I guess presidents still do it, don't they? They found a way to circumvent Congress and do things. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, so they made him the rank of temporary general, so it's written temporary on there. <coughs> All right, I'm, I'm just, some of the letters. Um, now I told you, to, to a scholar, you know, to a, a geeky historian uh, wannabe like me, uh, there's all kinds of information in these letters that will show up in books and all that, but because I only have a limited amount of time here, I only wanted to go through the major ones. This is the first page of Dr. John Thompson Darby's medical report of Hood's wounding at Gettysburg. And it gets into all kinds of details. It talks about what ligament here and the, what bone went here and there and all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's a doctor's report. It's not a normal, regular, normal, regular person's report. And with this one and the one that's on the next slide, which is just, it's going to look the same. In the Chickamauga report, 
I finished transcribing them, transcribing them to the best of my ability. Then I made an appointment with the museum, with the National Civil War Medicine Museum or whatever it's called in Frederick, Maryland. If anybody has never been there, it's got kind of a, of a geeky uh, sounding name, but it is a fine museum. And I had a meeting, I spent an entire afternoon with them, and they not only helped me with some of the words, they also explained to me why did they do that back then, and what was the purpose of this particular treatment, and what, what's a milk punch? Anybody know what a milk punch is? You do? A milk punch, I had to Google it, and it's a, it, it's a kind of like an eggnog kind of a drink uh, that was common in the South back then, and common in only the oldest parts of the Deep South now. But that was one of the things they were they gave Hood as you know as, I guess as, as part of an anesthetic. But anyway, the interesting thing about the Gettysburg Report is it was dated in December of 1863. Hood got wounded, as we know, in July of 1863. Hood was recovering from his Chickamauga wound in the in December of 1863. So why would Darby have written a report on on Hood's Gettysburg wound. The only explanation, I think, is the War Department or the Confederate High Command is considering whether Hood can go back into service or not. And they're wanting to know how's his arm. And because they know how his leg is, they're wanting to know how his arm is. So Darby probably, it's so detailed, but it's written six months later that Darby probably went to his notes. And, and his memory, and he, and he did the report. So that's the Gettysburg report. By the way, according, to, according to, to Darby's report, Hood had a lot more use of his left arm than what all of us have read. Uh, you know how it's, it was limp and it was useless at his side. According, this gets into so much detail. They talk about supination, pronation, how many fingers could move, where the thumb could go. It, it's unbelievable, unbelievable detail. All new to Civil War history. None of this stuff is known. That kid's so excited, he's a stranger. <laughs> um, there is the first page of about, a, I think it's 5,000 words. Uh, that is the Chickamauga Report. And it is so detailed. It said on a certain, on, on whatever, the 22nd or whatever it is, it says Hood was on his horse and he was standing up in the stirrups and he had turned to the right and he was in a certain position and the bone entered here and it hit this, or excuse me, the, the ball hit here and it hit this bone and it exited here. It's unbelievable. It has the names of all the surgeons who first took care of him then the names of the surgeons who got together and made the decision, and the names of the, surg the surgical team that did the amputation, and then a daily report every day, how he was feeling, how his mood was, how he slept, his energy, the medication that he was given, which was basically iron, because he had lost blood, they gave iron to him back then, they knew that, and he was given very, very small doses of morphine, only at night and only for sleep. And toward the end of this, they're weaning him off of the morphine. And they even write on there, slept without, slept without morphine tonight. So it's highly, de it is so detailed, it's sometimes almost embarrassing. They even mention the strength of the odor of his enemas. <laughs> now, I hated to say that, and you know, I'm reading this thing, and the poor man's been dead 150 years, and I'm sitting here reading something. I mean, I felt guilty, you know. Maybe I, I might redact that in here, but, but the lady at the museum, in, they said it was important because, you know, the blood, you know, you're rebuilding the blood, and, and, uh, and they have to give enemas because you're basically your, your excretory system shuts down after a severe, anyway. Just incredible detail, incredible detail. Okay, which one is it? Oh, okay. Again, some people know a lot, and I, and I don't want to talk over anybody's head, and I also don't want to be too rudimentary, 
One of the big criticisms of Hood was, was that after he was promoted to Lieutenant General and was sent to command a corps under Joe Johnston in the Army of Tennessee, that he started writing poison pen letters. He was secretly writing these letters back to, hot, to Richmond, trying to make Johnston look bad so that he could get Johnston's job. That's the line. There is one known letter that Hood wrote to Jefferson Davis, and the first sentence, the wording kind of suggests that Hood may have been answering the letter. But it's, it's not really sure. I found a letter in Hood's papers. It is a letter that Hood wrote to Lewis T. Wigfall, who at the time was a, a senator from Texas. He had been commander of the Texas Brigade he resigned to become a Texas senator, and Hood, that's when Hood got command of the Texas Brigade. This is a letter that Hood wrote to Wigfall, April 5, 1864, and he's, he has just got down to Georgia, and he's serving under Joe Johnston. First of all, how in the world did a letter that Hood wrote to Wigfall end up back in Hood's papers? I was wondering the same thing. I found four letters from Hood to Wigfall, and I'm thinking, hell no, these must be copies. Later on, I find a cover letter from Wigfall's daughter to Hood's daughter, dated like in 1905, saying we were just going through Daddy's papers, and we wanted to return these letters that your dad wrote my dad, and we want to give them back to your family. Thank goodness, because in the first line of this one, of this one letter, it says, your letter of the 29th of March has just been received and I will, and I hasten to answer your direct questions. That proves that Hood's poison pen letters were not poison pen letters. Senators and presidents and secretaries of war and whoever, they were actually writing to Hood saying, what's Joe Johnston doing? Because Joe Johnston was famous for being very secretive. So what do you do if, if, if the president sends you a letter and says, hey, what's going on down there? What are you going to do? Say it's none of your business? So that's an important letter from a scholastic standpoint that a hood defender like me was glad to come across. Okay, Spring Hill. How am I doing on time? Just getting there? Uh, I'm okay? All right. Everybody in here at least somewhat familiar with Spring Hill? Okay. Does anybody want a 30-second explanation of Spring Hill? Does anybody need one? Yeah. Is everybody yeah, good? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, All right. Hood, Hood, Hood takes the Army of Tennessee after Atlanta. They're trying to do something. They're trying to, they're, they're, it's a Hail Mary. Sherman's on his march to the sea, and there's nobody to resist him. Hood cannot catch up because he's 100 miles behind him, and Sherman is burning every, there's no way Hood's going to catch him. So they decide that Hood is going to invade Nashville, invade Tennessee, liberate Nashville, move on up into Kentucky, and then possibly go to the aid of Lee, who's bottled up outside of Richmond. And what that would do is, is that would cause Sherman to have to come back because there were no more federal troops of, of any numbers uh, around. So Hood takes off from Florence, Alabama, and he's heading north to Nashville. George Thomas in Nashville, who's the overall commander in Nashville, he's only got about 10 or 15,000 quartermasters in Nashville, and really the only combat troops he has is under the command of John Schofield, and he's in Pulaski, Tennessee. So here's Hood in Florence, Alabama. Here's Schofield in Pulaski, Tennessee, and here's Nashville. So Hood takes off, and he's wanting to cut off Schofield before he gets to Nashville. Schofield, gets, Schofield finds out about it, and he starts racing for Nashville. So they're both racing for Nashville. Hood catches up to Schofield in Columbia, Tennessee, national headquarters location. Schofield is dug in and fortified, and Hood decides, rather than attack Schofield head-on, which is his reputation, Hood decides he's going to take two of his three Army Corps, and he's going to cross the river and try to get behind Schofield. So he leaves one corps in Columbia and all of his artillery as a diversion and flanks Schofield to the north and he ends up at Spring Hill. 
Schofield finds out about the flank a little bit later, but he's got to be careful as he withdraws because he's got Stephen D. Lee's corps and 100 guns to worry about. So Schofield and 25,000 troops start marching up the road toward Nashville. Hood and the two corps get to Spring Hill, and this is where the mess starts. They get there just before dark. And they align and they do some attacking and there's some advanced troops there, some Yankee troops, I won't get into all that. But what happens is Hood orders, according to Hood, in his memoirs, Hood says, I gave Frank Cheatham repeated orders to block the road. Hood, Hood prints that in his <coughs> memoirs, but Hood dies even before they're published. So their pub, Hood dies in 1879. His memoirs are published in 1880. And he says that he gave Cheatham these orders, and Cheatham did not follow the orders. Well, Cheatham has the advantage and the luxury of outliving Hood. So if you all have any rivals in your life, if you outlive them, I'll guarantee you <laughs> history is going to smile on you. Because you're going to be able to say what you say, and nobody's going to say anything about it. So in Hood's memoir, he gives... He, t he only gives one bit of evidence. James Ratchford, a member of his staff, said, I took orders to Cheatham and gave the orders for Cheatham to attack the road, and Cheatham says, I never got them. There's another, there's another witness who was another staff member of Hood who said, not only did I send orders to Cheatham, but so did my colleagues Major Blanton and Major Hamilton. Historians have always said these guys, these two guys are staff members of Hood, so they were just, you know, they're lying to help their old boss. And that and and so Cheatham denied it, and history has sided with Cheatham until now. Here is a letter. This is a letter from W W, w. Old to Hood. And Old says i got to read you the first paragraph. Doesn't have anything to Spring Hill. It's kind of funny. This is real good hand. This is the best handwriting of all, and it's even hard to read. This one says, September 10th, blah, blah, blah. My dear sir, I met this morning with Mr. E.L. Martin, who was an aide-de-camp of General Edward Johnson at Nashville. W.W. W. Old was also a major, and he was on Ed Johnson's staff. So he is talking about E.L. Martin. He and E.L. Martin are both majors, and they're on Ed Johnson's staff. Ed Johnson was captured at Nashville. Ed Johnson at Nashville. I'd had a conversation with him in regard to the cause of the general's capture. He says the general had left his horse with a courier and not with a staff officer, and that the courier took flight and left with the general's horse. <laughs> so now we know how Ed Johnson got captured. He, he, the, the, somebody stole his horse during the retreat. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Here's the important part. In regard to the attack at Spring Hill, Mr. Martin says that General Johnson did go to, to General Cheatham and beg, underline, wherever that is, y'all follow that along, beg him to attack uh, with his division, stating that he did not even require any support, but that General Cheatham refused, stating finally he was opposed to night attacks. Mr. Martin says he was present. If you wish to correspond with him, his address. There was, there was no letter to or from Martin in there. So here is a guy who is not a member of Hood's staff who says Cheatham, now this is now like the fifth or the sixth person that has said that Frank Cheatham said he didn't like night attacks. And, you know, I even went and read Cheatham's official report at Chickamauga, and he was involved in a night attack at Chickamauga, and it didn't go well. So then there's this one. This is a letter from Steve, now by the way, it, some of these things are two and three page letters and I'm only giving you the page that is the important part. All right, this is a letter from, uh, yeah, I gotta make sure I got them in order here. This is from Stephen D. Lee, April 25th, 1879, just a few months before Hood died. And I'll read it to you. Uh, I've got this out of order. I want to read. Oh, this is the one I want to read you. Um, I knew this had happened. Yeah. Hey, this is. Uh, 
All right, I got the wrong one. Let me, re let me read this to you, it's important. It corroborates Old and Ratchford at what happened at Spring Hill, and it throws in another bit of a bombshell. People familiar with Patrick Claiborne, familiar with how he died and where he died and supposedly what was going on in his mind when he died. The interpretation has been was that Hood blamed him for, he had heard that Hood blamed him for Spring Hill the night before. He got mad that his honor had been challenged by his commanding general and that he decided, by God, I'm going to show General Hood that I am, you know, wasn't to blame and in, in, in what I've heard, angry. He was mad at Hood and he kind of lost control and he charged up and he got killed. Well, not, ac not according to other people. Stephen D. Lee to Hood. Um, blah, 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 blah. I met A.P. Stewart at Columbus about six weeks ago and profounded. Why was no battle delivered at Spring Hill? He replied in substance that Cheatham and Cleburne determined it was not best to bring on an engagement at night. He said, or her, he, said he heard or believed that Cleburne regretted it immediately afterwards, which would have been the next morning when they discovered that the Yankees had gone, and said no such weight should be on his mind for similar cause again, which is a 19th century way of saying it ain't gonna happen again, and in that feeling lost his life at Franklin soon thereafter. So according to A.P. Stewart, Claiborne and Cheatham decided we better not attack at night they're not going anywhere the next morning Claiborne wakes up and thinks oh my god they're gone and I had some something to do with I don't know I either agreed with Cheatham or whatever and basically what Patrick Claiborne did according to this it was basically suicide by Yankee the next morning trying to redeem himself that that what was going on in Claiborne's mind wasn't I'm mad at Hood and I'm going to show him that I'm a great fighter. It was, I'm responsible for this and I'm going to do my best to make it work out. So was it regret? Was it remorse? Or was it regret? So this is very important and you know the, the standard interpretation of what Claiborne was thinking when he was charging the works at Franklin now has to be totally reconsidered according to A.P. Stewart. Um, the one I showed you, no, not that one. I don't even know what that one is. I think I made that mistake. Um, this is another one from S.D. Lee, and uh, this is really important. It says, now this is the one that's a few, I've got these messed up, so it's not that one. Just, this is the important one. It's April 25th, 1879, it's just a few months before Hood died. Lee writes to Hood, I enclose your report as I received one yesterday from the Southern Historical Society of Richmond. I do hope your book will make clear the Spring Hill matter, for it is time for that mystery to be cleared up. If you do not, I will feel it is my duty to do so after your book comes out. Stephen D. Lee's telling Hood, Cheatham screwed up at Spring Hill in an earlier letter, and you're not wanting to blame Cheatham, and it's time that the mystery gets cleared up. You better put it in your book. If you don't do it, I will after your book comes out. And then another interesting thing, and I'll tell, I won't even read it to you. I'll just tell it to you. This is really interesting, and I'm getting near the, the end, so I'm glad everybody's hanging with me here. Um, Franklin is, is infamous or famous for many things. One of the things was Ed Johnson, we're back to Ed Johnson again, his famous night attack. And if you remember, or if you know, Hood did, a, Hood did a frontal assault at Franklin because they could see the Yankee trains escaping up toward Nashville and it was getting dark. And Hood had a decision to make. Well, do I attack right now before dark or I'm going to have to deal with him in, in Nashville because he did not have time to do another flank. It was getting dark. So six divisions attack. 
And right after the initial attack, Ed Johnson's division, which is part of S.D. Lee's Corps, is the first of S.D. Lee's Corps to show up, and it's after dark. Ed Johnson shows up to Hood, and he says, where do I get? He says, go, to, go and do whatever Cheatham wants you to do. So they send, they send Ed Johnson over to Cheatham, and Cheatham, sends, Cheatham says to Ed Johnson's division, I want you to go forward and go in support of Bait. One of the six divisions that attacked in the frontal charge was, was William Bait's division. Johnston's division was to go in in support of Bait. They had no guides. They had torches. Can you imagine? The guides on the end of the division had torches. And here's what this letter says. I had never heard this nor had Richard McMurray or Eric Jacobson or any of the Battle of Franklin experts. Johnson was told, Bates' men are up at the works, so when you go in, don't shoot, or you'll hit Bates' men in the back. <coughs> so Johnson's men hold their fire, go forward, and are decimated, and can't shoot back. Remember, Johnson's division is a part of Lee's Corps. In a letter from Lee to Hood, it says, again, uh, yes. again, I understand that Bates' division did not go to the works at all, and that had he done so, his left would have rested upon the blah, 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 blah. When Johnson made his most gallant attack after dark, he was cautioned not to fire till he reached the work, the works as Bates' men were there, and that's underlined. They were not there, and the report was at the time, they never were there. The loss in my gallant division speaks for their work. Uh, it captured stands, blah, blah, blah. I never saw General Bates' division, nor saw him during the night. I would esteem it a favor if you would give me some information on this point. How did Bates' losses compare with the other troops? I may be misinformed about General Bates' division. As you know, I moved out the next morning and blah, 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 blah. But his troops were not at his works when my gallant division got there, nor, if my recollection is, co is correct, were many of his dead. According to Lee, Johnson's division was supposed to go forward. Don't shoot. You're going to hit your own men. They get up there, and there aren't any. I then checked the casualties by division of the Battle of Franklin. And of the seven divisions involved, the first six plus Johnson, Bates' division was less than half of the sixth most, or the sixth least casualties. So I'm not a Battle of Franklin historian. I'm not a military analyst. I don't know what I am, really. I'm a pain in the butt to the guys who've been writing for the last 30 years. But they're going to have to look into that. I think. You know, here's Johnson's division suffered, I don't know, six or seven hundred casualties, and Bates suffered like three hundred. And then you had you had divisions like Claiborne's division and uh, well, there were two divisions that had over one thousand casualties. And so Bates was Bates was half of what the average was. So uh, anyway, so there were uh, there's all kinds of important stuff in those letters and I've given you all you know, the easiest ones to explain, I guess, you know, in the shortest amount of time with the least amount of having to fill you in, you know, to bring you up to speed without, you know, maps and all that sort of stuff. But it was a remarkable experience on my part. It's like, I told people, you know, I'm sitting there holding letters that Robert E. Lee wrote to John Bell Hood, and I'm doing it in the quiet of somebody's spare bedroom, and these letters haven't been opened, and 150 years and I'm just sitting here and I'm you know I'm going like this and it's just one after another uh, letter of condolence from William T. Sherman to John Bell Hood the day after Hood's wife died Hood never got the letter because he died two days later and here's a letter from Sherman by the way uh, another little real quick thing if I've still got everybody's attention um, is everybody familiar with the odd behavior by Hood that he started having, pro the insurance company that he worked for out of St. Louis went belly up, so Hood started having financial problems in the late 1700s. He gathered up what he called his war papers, and he took them to Washington to try to sell them.
to the government because the government was actually paying for some of the papers that ended up going into the official records. So Hood goes to Washington, and by the way, he was quite the celebrity. He writes home, it's in the book, but he writes home to his wife, uh, General Sherman took me to meet, General, uh, to meet the president today, and I met the president and his brother, and two members of his cabinet, and the Supreme Court Justice, and the Secretary of War. Anyway, Hood goes there, and people, know, people don't know that. Uh, scholarship knows that Hood went up there, tried to get the deal closed, and for whatever reason they couldn't get the deal consummated, he left the papers there and went back to New Orleans. He left the paper, of all people to leave the papers with, he left them with William Sherman, the guy who kicked his ass at the end of the war. <laughs> and everybody, and, 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 and if you read anything about it, these authors and historians, they, all, they say in typical stupid John Bell Hood uh, conduct, or in, in irresponsible, or odd, or impulsive, anyway, they, and, and I remember when, when I was reading it, I'd say, that seemed like a guy you might not want to leave him with. As it turns out, there's a letter in there from Hood to his wife from St. Louis in like the mid-1870s, and he says, General Sherman called upon me at the hotel and wants me to dine with him tonight. When I was in town last year, he called on me to dine, and I just wasn't in the mood. I really don't even want to go tonight, but if I refuse him twice in a row, it won't seem nice, so I'm going to have dinner with him. Then there's the letter, there's a letter. In the letter, this is what kind of got me off on this, in the letter that Hood, or excuse me, the letter that Sherman wrote to Hood, condolences on the loss of your wife that Hood never received, Sherman says, I remember just last winter when I was in New Orleans and my family visited your family and those beautiful little children of yours, now without a mother, and I remember that Mrs. Hood was upstairs sick in bed and that your two little daughters took my three little daughters up. Anyway, they, it's a trend. Sherman, and, Sherman and Hood had become great friends after the war. So now if you would read, if you all would read that Hood left his papers with William T. Sherman and left, just trusted him with them, if you all were reading that in the book, you'd think, that's crazy. Well, right now if you read it in the book, you're not going to think it's so crazy. Anyway, there's all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, his memoir, this is the last thing. There's another letter in there where he says, Gibson, Randall Gibson, who, by the way, is buried in Lexington, he, his wife's family was from Versailles. That's how he ended up here. Uh, Randall Gibson was a good friend of Hood's, a brigade commander under Hood, lived in New Orleans after the war, was the godfather of Hood's oldest daughter, and was a Louisiana congressman. Hood's in Washington, and he says to his wife, he says, hey, I let Gibson read my manuscript, and he says he likes it, but he makes a suggestion. He thinks that I should put something in the book about my life prior to joining Johnston. And then I can call it a memoir. So if you've ever read Advance and Retreat, it's really weird. Because like three-fourths of it is, a, is just an answer to Johnston. And then there's this little bit in the front about Hood from being born in Owingsville all the way to joining Johnston's army. It's so sparse. Well, now we know why. Now we know why. It was never intended to be a memoir, and then Gibson says, hey, put that in there and you can call it a memoir. So anyway, there's all kinds of stuff in there that I could, like I told you I could be here for a couple of hours, and <laughs> thankfully they close it out so you all can go home. But that's it. And uh, I hope you all are even more proud now of Kentucky's famous Confederate